Good afternoon, everybody. Running a handful of minutes late. Uh, my name is Barry Colfer. I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs. Very warm welcome to those who are joining us here in person uh, in full colour at our headquarters in central Dublin. And indeed, a very warm welcome to those online. And that counts for our speakers as well as our attendees, because our panel, our expert panel today, I'm really thrilled, uh, really looking forward to the conversation, are spread across Dublin and Varna in Bulgaria, where John O'Brennan is, is joining us. A quick little bit of housekeeping, this, uh, this event post-European Parliament elections, what's next? It's in keeping with what we usually do at the Institute by trying to promote informed and interesting discussions around topics of import. But we're making a slight variation in that the excellent panellists are not invited to deliver a stump speech. We're just going straight into conversation uh, and we'll do that for about 30 minutes with our panelists and then turn it over to you, our audience, again, online and in person. Just some of the housekeeping. The uh, event is on the record. If you wish to participate in the discussion here, just draw attention to yourself conventionally by raising your hand. And those online, if you wish to do so similarly by using the Q&A function on Zoom. I'm going to very briefly introduce our three panelists. And then, John, I'm going to hand over to you in Bulgaria in a few moments just to give a little bit of scene setting, because this week, of course, I didn't mention why we're doing it this week. This is a very exciting couple of weeks for people like many of us in the room here who are interested in things EU and things European, but this week especially, because some of the top jobs and some of the top roles for the next five years are going to be confirmed. And indeed, I think we can confirm that Roberta Mazzola has renewed her, her presidency with a, a stonking 500 plus vote in the European Parliament just to kick off what's going to be an exciting week in Strasbourg. So I'm first of all, in a moment, going to turn to John, John O'Brennan, who is a stranger to, uh, I think, nobody who will be involved in this call. John is professor in the Department of Sociology at Maynooth University and is director of the Maynooth Centre for European and Eurasian Studies. John's an expert on EU enlargement and an Ireland's experience of European integration, among much else. Here in Dublin, in town, we're joined by uh, two uh, people again who will, I think, require limited, uh, if, if any, introduction, but just to keep with convention. Francis Fitzgerald, to my far left, is an international leader and influencer on equality from Ireland, I realise what I said there, uh, who, who is currently serving a two-year term as a member of the Gender Equality Advisory Council in the G7. A parliamentarian for over 20 years, Francis has served as Thornister, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Business, Enterprise and Innovation, Minister for Justice and Equality, and was the state's first Minister for Children and Youth Affairs. Uh, she held the position of MEP for five years from 2019, so just the last legislature, so experience of a very kind of fresh nature, uh, where she served on the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee, the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, and the Development Committee, three very powerful committees in the European Parliament. Then finally, to my immediate left, delighted to be joined by Marion Harkin, TD, uh, Marion served as an MEP from 2004 to 2019, when I worked there myself, Marion, not for you, but kind of in your orbit. As a member, Marion was um, an MEP as a member of the group for group of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, ALDI. She was first elected as an independent in 2004 for the Connacht Ulster region and was re-elected in 2009 and 2014 to represent the Northern and Western region. Marion was the coordinator for the ALDI group on the Committee for Employment and Social Affairs, and also sat on the Agriculture and Finance Committees in the European Parliament. Also very significant um, roles, very significant committees. In 2012, Marion became Vice President of the European Democratic Party. In 2020, after 15 years as an MEP, moving between Brussels, Strasbourg, Sligo and elsewhere, Marion was re-elected to Dáil Éireann as an independent for Sligo, Leitrim, North West Common and South Donegal. So I can, can't think of many better panels to discuss this exciting week. John, could you just provide a little bit of context? What are we looking at this week in Strasbourg? Well, thanks, Barry, and it's very, very nice to be with you and a particular pleasure uh, to share the panel with Francis and with Marion, both of whom I have tremendous admiration for. Um, just maybe three points, Barry, in this brief uh, primary intervention. First, um, we began the year with the prospect of this mammoth landscape of elections, about 40% of the people on the panel eligible to vote. And I was one of those people who was terrified at what we were facing in Europe, partly at national level and partly at European level. And 
I think the reaction to the elections in June was one broadly of relief that the center ground held. Now, I think the answer to that is yes, it didn't, and no, it didn't. Yes, it is holding, and no, it isn't. Um, the European People's Party had a good election, I think, coming back with 188 seats, although I should stress that's about 100 seats less than the EPP had at the conclusion of the 2009-2014 parliamentary term. Socialists and Democrats come back with 136. And the other part of the centre, although it had a bad election, Renew Europe comes back with 77 uh, and the Greens with 53. And if you look at the composite figures, there looks like a more compelling case again that the centre ground is holding. If you put together the joint uh, score of EPP and SND, that's up to 324 seats short of the 361 majority, but nevertheless about 45% uh, of the vote. Uh, you add in Renew Europe, it takes you to 56% or 401 seats. We'll come back to that because I think that will be important when we come to the vote for Commission President on Thursday. And if you add in the Greens, it comes to about 64% or 447. So there looks to be a really strong uh, continuing majority for centrist policies in the parliament. But I think we should also be looking what's happening at the European Council and at national level, because there the picture I think is genuinely more alarming. By the end of this year, almost a third of European council members will either be those led by the far right as in Italy, or where you have the far right as part of a governing coalition in Finland, Croatia, the Netherlands, um, in Sweden, that's not the case, but the Sweden Democrats are very significant. We have a federal election coming up in Austria, new government respectively in Belgium. So what I want to do is puncture this notion that these elections represent the continuing triumph of the century, because the European Council demonstrate very clearly a trajectory that is moving in the direction of the far right. So even if put together, the three different far right groups have about 26% uh, overall, about 188 seats in total. The presence in the European Council, which in many respects is more important, is one I think that is really alarming for Europeans. All the more so, I would say, in the context of what's happening in the United States. Some of our members will remember Ivan Krastev talking earlier in the year when he was in Dublin about the importance of the US presidential election as a European election, as an election that was going to really significantly impact on the contours of politics in Europe. I think it's absolutely clear that Trump is going to win, that it's going to be a much more radical presidency than the first time around. The entire structure of American pluralism is uh, threatened by Trump and J.D. Vance, his vice presidential nominee. And like others, I think, chancelleries around Europe should be preparing very seriously for what is to come. Amongst other things, the fact that for the first time since 1949, Europeans may have to defend themselves. So defense and security, I think, is going to take on acute importance for the next commission and during the next political cycle. Just a final word about the vote on the commission. Um, I'm not surprised that Robert Roberta Mazzola got such a strong vote. She's hugely popular. I think she absolutely deserves it. I am not so sure about von der Leyen. And again, the consensus in Brussels and other places in recent months has been that von der Leyen was almost a shoe in to come back as commission president. I never believed that that was certain to happen. And I think she could well be defeated on Thursday. And if that happens, we're going to have an, an unprecedented institutional crisis and interinstitutional crisis within the union 
comparable to what happened quarter century ago. But I think probably because these are much more demanding circumstances, much more serious for the European Union. I don't think anybody knows what the European Council is going to do if uh, von der Leyen is rejected by the Parliament. The fact that the Fianna Fáil MEPs are saying, for example, that they will not vote for her, to me raises questions about uh, the rest of Renew Europe and about the Socialists and Democrats. Her, her support, her unequivocal support for Israel after the 7th of October, even in the light of the extraordinary mass murder being committed by Israeli troops, I think that has really alienated huge numbers of people on the center left and in the center. And that could well show up in the vote uh, on Thursday. So that majority of 400 or so uh, that von der Leyen nominally has I think that could peel away. There's almost inevitably a peeling away in votes of this kind of up to about 13 or 14 percent. If that happens, she's going to be very borderline, to say the least. So Thursday could be one of the most important days we've had in the European Union for a very long time. I leave it at that for now, Barry. Glad to come back to you a little bit later. Again, but really, really good scene setting. Thanks a million. I'm going to first of all turn to Francis and then to you, Marion. And the three issues that John raised there around the centre ground, whether it has held, whether it has changed. Francis, you sat with the centre-right EPP group. Marion, you sat with the, I think, correctly described centrist Aldi group. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to know what you, you think, what John said there about the centre ground, the, the extent to which it has held and the extent to which perhaps it has changed. Secondly, John mentioned about the US elections and what that might mean for us. And then this prospect of an inter-institutional crisis after Thursday if von der Leyen is not elected, although we, we, we can't tell whether she has the votes or not. Do you wish to respond to any of those three or indeed anything else you'd like to mobilize at this stage? I mean, fantastic summary from yeah, John, I have left? to say. I mean, really super. And I agree with almost everything he has to say, actually. I mean, I spent weeks before the elections listening to research, European Research Council, all sorts of research bodies actually telling us that the right were going to be predominant, really. That was a very strong research, uh, opinion poll kind of consensus. And it's very interesting in the same way that we saw changes here in the elections uh, that were somewhat unexpected. I think we saw the same in Europe. So I've just come from a four day meeting with the EPP in Portugal and they are absolutely delighted in the sense that the center has held. But I think what John said about the move uh, to the right, I think there is a, uh, something he didn't address, mm -hmm. which is that the center has also moved slightly to the right. Exactly. And that's you know, worth a discussion and it's, it's quite interesting in its own way. But in terms of worries about extreme right, um, I think the, the center has held, but we have also seen the growth uh, on the right, undoubtedly, you know, whether it's uh, in, in, in France, in Germany, um, we're going to have a center, an extreme center right, an extreme right group, I should say, uh, in the parliament under the Patriots, under Orban now. Um, and I think that that will be an interesting dynamic. And the question will be how much that central platform will hold mm. uh, between uh, EPP, uh, Socialists and Renew. And if it holds, a lot can happen. Will it hold, for example, to keep uh, Orban out uh, of getting a vice president elected? You know, maybe a micro issue, but it'll be mm. it's an interesting taster in terms of uh, attitudes to the, the far right by that centrist grouping. So that will come up. I think the election of uh, Roberta, very, very strong, personally, you know, very popular, very effective, a very good figurehead uh, for the European Parliament. She's increased her vote, actually. So um, oh. I think that's very significant. In relation to Ursula, uh, it's a secret ballot. That definitely makes a difference. Um, I think there will be a losing of some votes, no doubt about that. Um, but the centrist grouping equally, it's very symbolic in terms of keeping her in position. Because if she does lose, um, it's, it's a rejection of a, a centrist platform, you could say for the reasons mm -hmm. primarily around us, I, I think, because mm -hmm. if you go through her leadership, and I won't go through it here, but if you go through four or five key areas in the last few years, she's an extremely effective leader. I know her very well personally. She's very courageous. 
Gaza clearly has alienated her. I would say particularly in Ireland and Slovakia, more than other countries. So how much peeling away there will be of her vote in relation to that from across Europe, I'm not so sure. Um, um, it will be tight. I mean, they, if 10 out of 14 of the Irish MEPs vote against her, that's a very significant grouping and could be quite... Uh, you know, could determine uh, the outcome actually uh, in many ways because last time it was only nine votes that yeah, yeah. she won by. So I, I, I think you're going to see a more right parliament, undoubtedly, but that there is still a kind of a central platform uh, that obviously rejects extreme nationalism, extreme right wing uh, ideology, and I'd like to see that holding myself. Before turning to you, Marion, there's just something I wanted to ask. Well, two things, Francis. Uh, we've had an, uh, an invitation outstanding to Robin Matola, Roberta Matola, for the past couple of uh, years. If you could follow up with her, I given that you're friends, that'd be much appreciated. <laughs> but, but, but in all seriousness, the um, I'm interested in this notion of whether the centre has held or whether it has changed. And it's, it's ironic you're in Portugal. Your EPP colleagues in Portugal are the Social Democrats in Portugal. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Social Democrats, but who sit in the, in, in the centre-right group. Do you have a sense that you could be willing to share that the nature of the EPP is changing? What's what political scientists call the Overton window, the range of ideas that are acceptable to, to discussion and whether the center of gravity in the EPP is shifting as a response to the increased kind of support yes, I, for the harder right. I think it probably is. And one of the things when I was elected, I, I was kind of intrigued by within the EPP was the criticism of particularly the Greens. And uh, yeah. uh, and the left control and are having to do so many deals with the left or with the socialists and let's say and and with the Greens it goes against the DNA of the EPP because they were used to a majority but let's face it the reality yeah. is is coalitions and building consensus particularly in the European Parliament but I do think the next five years you are going to see um, you know you're going to see uh, a request to have. Uh, less demands on business, for example, whereas we had the uh, corporate responsibility, et cetera, due diligence and so on this time, which I thought was very good. And I think business has responded quite well. Um, there's going to be a focus on far less red tape for business. Undoubtedly, the Draghi report is coming up in December or September. Uh, very interesting to see what's in that. And I think you are going to see uh, a lot more requests to support families uh, and individuals in implementing the Green Deal and uh, less, less ideological about it, if you like, mm -hmm. given the green results and so mm -hmm. on. So you're definitely going to see that kind of a shift. Uh, and I would describe it myself as, uh, as more right. But I think the big focus in Europe is going to be geopolitics, not going to be economics, although that is a key mm -hmm. issue because Ukraine is costing so much and we put so much money into Ukraine. But I think it's a geopolitics are going to be the key issue going forward, as well as a number of other areas. I mean, if Trump comes in, how is Europe going to be competitive? How are you going to keep innovation in Europe? These are the big questions uh, of the moment. Thanks a million. Marion, thanks for your patience. Would you wish to respond to anything that John or Francis said? Or you've come prepared as well, I see. Oh, sure. yes. Uh, fair play. Um, I suppose listening to both of them, John has a lot of experience. Francis is fresh from the parliament. At this point, I'm relying on hearsay and gossip. But to some extent, gossip can be you know, quite interesting. I spoke to a few people who, and most of them staff, because I don't know if you'll agree with me when she is Sir Barry, staff often know more than MEPs because they're talking to the different offices and they hear stuff. So sometimes if you want to know what's happening in the parliament, having a good relationship with staff is, is useful. But just coming back to what Francis said and John about the right, and in a way, when Francis was nodding and I sort of found myself nodding a little bit, I thought, is this part of the problem that there's too many people nodding, you know, agreeing on certain issues when we see how the numbers are playing out in the parliament? We have the right, we have the far right, we have the hard right, and it's, it's how they will interact with one another. If you look, for example, at the, the Patriots, there's a lot of very individual, you know, very strong individuals there. How will they work together? Let's say Orban with um, uh, Le Pen, uh, will they manage, will they keep together, will they keep a focus on what's happening 
in the parliament. I suppose there is a sense that that movement is happening. I agree with you, Francis. Even though the centre held, I think the two groups that were hardest hit were Renew and the Greens. Uh, and I, uh, the reason I think that is because um, I think the EPP had that breadth of uh, opinion that allowed people mm -hmm. to vote for it in different countries. Not sure Renew had that. And the Greens certainly didn't. And I agree with Francis as well. I think we have a much more pragmatic perspective now on green politics. Von der Leyen is talking about, um, you know, a fair price for farmers in the food chain. Those of us who have been in the parliament for a long time just wish that was something mm. that was really on the agenda a long time ago. Obviously, the tractors rolling down Rubelliard have had an impression. So um, I, I think that at the moment, it's very uncertain. Uh, there are, if you look even at ECR, there are probably the Belgians and the Czechs may vote for von der Leyen. And we don't know what Maloney is going to do. You know, maybe, maybe there's an Italian commissioner who might be looking for a decent job you, you just don't know how that sort of stuff will will work out. So I think von der Leyen has a real chance and she can get votes from everywhere and anywhere. And we just don't know. But I, I know from speaking to some people in Renew that they weren't really all that happy with her. Um, I think she promised some documentation, written documentation, which hasn't yet arrived. So little things like that. But then... The issue for a group like Renew is if von der Leyen isn't um, elected, what's going to happen to Kaya Kallis? No, but it's not even Callis, just yeah. that. What's going to happen to their nominee, Kaya Kallis, mm -hmm. who's already resigned? So there's lots of horse trading going on. It's um, I think von der Leyen still has a, a fair chance of being elected from the gossip that I'm hearing, but that's just gossip. It's it's not anything anything more than that. But I do think she has. I think a lot of people maybe because it's a secret ballot might look very deep in their hearts and say, "This maybe is bigger than me." And I am surprised that Fianna Fáil are voting against her. I know they said it during the election, and to to follow on from what you've said. Is, is absolutely critical for voters. But I wonder, was that policy or was it just election pressure? Um, mm. I spoke to Kieran Malouli uh, this morning. He told me nobody ever asked him, ever, was he voting for von der Leyen. Anyway. So, in the whole That's campaign, true. So, oh, just, sorry, in terms of, of his own election, yeah, I understand. Yeah, sorry, yeah. We're asked him. Mm -hmm. So, I think because a smallish number of people were really raising it as an issue. It became important. I think for most people, they don't even know who she is. So um, you don't know what people will do when they know it won't be red, it won't be green, and it'll be blue, and nobody will know. Sure. So we see. Sure, nobody knows that better than than you two when it gets to the, the primacy of the ballot box. You never know how people are going to, going to vote. Um, just to make clear, we deal very much in gossip and hearsay here at the Institute, <laughs> by the way. So I'm at home. So. You are very much at home. It's the few we, we run off. And I also agree with you, of course, it's the staff at the EP that keeps the place running also. Um, I was interested just in your, your own group, um, which has become their own new group. There is a, a real density of Irish MEPs within that group now. There is, yeah. As it's reduced in size, the kind of Irish cohort has, you know, uh, the, the what are the exact numbers now? There's six Irish MEPs in Renew and the, and the numbers are 50 odd, is it? John? 77. 77. Yeah, 77. and six, six Irish members. So, I mean, most of the time there was just one. There was TJ Matter in the old group. Then there was Pat Cox. Mm -hmm. Then there was myself. And five years after I was there, Fianna Fáil joined. I didn't touch it. Good. No, that's the, that's to your great credit, um, Marion, so, as, as a consensus builder. But just in terms of, if you can share a bit of you, it was very interesting, I think, to hear Francis talking about the inner workings of the EPP. 
what's the future of of the what I would always think of as the other group, but they're a new group uh, in this coming legislature. I'm not sure about that, to be honest. I mean, I think the fact that the uh, president uh, remained as president, the chair of the group, um, was, you know, there was a bit of toing and froing about that, but she has remained. I think you know, that's important for the French. Um, and I think, as you said earlier, Francis, um, you know, the outcome of uh, general elections are going to be crucial. And the French one absolutely is. I mean, will Macron manage to keep his commissioner in place? Mm -hmm. You know, because he's in charge, I think, of security and defence, isn't he? Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's that's one of the top two items on the agenda for von der Leyen and will be for Europe. So for France to have that power play, as it were, and keep him in place will be important. But going back to, to Renew, to be honest, I'm, I suppose I'm five years gone out of it now, so you do lose a bit of touch on it. But I do know <laughs> their egos are quite bruised mm -hmm. to, to be fifth. I know it's just by, by one seat, but nonetheless, the figures don't lie. I mean, that is that is a real come down. When Especially in my second term there, it was absolutely the swing group. Absolutely. And, um, and that matters, you know. So um, they're chastened somewhat, I would say, uh, whereas the EPP have held on, even though you did remind us, John, 100 seats less. I hadn't realised that from that height in 2014. I mean, that's that's astonishing in its own way. It's the fact that they held on this time, you know. But this is what's happening everywhere, isn't it? We're seeing a greater fragmentation of politics. And I think what John said about member states and that move to authoritarianism, you could say, I mean, just poses that very big challenge for, for us all of defending democracy yeah, yeah. and the need for very strong EU institutions. And it does put the von der Leyen vote in that context as yeah, well, yeah. because I think, uh, you know, a vote for her is, is actually a vote for, you know, protecting those institutions for a whole variety of reasons I won't go into, but I do see it in that context. And I see it as continuity and I see it as a strong statement of the, the centrist groupings uh, support for her. So as John said, if that doesn't work on Thursday and you just don't know, it is a secret ballot. Now, I do think, uh, again, uh, Marion's right, but she will be getting votes from the Greens. She probably she get will. votes from uh, Italy and ECR. I, you know, it's a very probably personal will. relationship there. I wouldn't be surprised. On the other hand, I don't think they've made any public declarations. If they did, that would mean that she'd probably lose some of the socialists and probably renew. So it's a, it's a very delicate balance. She's working unbelievably hard to mm. do everything she can. It won't be for a lack of work on her on her behalf. You know what trading she's doing. Nobody knows. But I think her speech on the morning is going to be terribly important because she's going to be trying to respond to, you know, the various discussions. I mean, it's it's a nightmare. And I think she's had very difficult meetings with Renew, for example. Yeah, I gather yeah. when she got a lecture from Fianna Fáil, I gather the uh, actual atmosphere was icy in the room. No doubt. Um, because that's not something those groups tend to do to people in that position, you know, that sort of a lecture that she got. So that did not go down very well. And... Uh, you know, it, 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 it's a very important week, I think, for, from the whole point of view of defending democracy and, you know, dealing with this authoritarian threat, which, you know, with Trump as well, the dynamics and the geopolitics of Europe um, are going to be, you know, Europe. I mean, I have heard people saying we dealt with him before we deal with mm -hmm. him again. And that is true. Uh, but Europe is going to have, have to, to stand on its own two feet. And even from a security and defence point of view, I think you'll see a changing debate in Ireland as well. I mean, if he does come in, Europe is much more on its own and we're in the middle of a war. And, uh, you know, we're in a war that requires huge armaments, that requires huge money uh, and political support. And is so serious because Moldova and other Eastern European countries are extremely worried about what mm -hmm. would happen if Ukraine do not win. And Orban's moves, of course, don't help that. Oh, certainly. And just next Friday, we'll be hosting the Moldovan foreign minister. That is a real, a real interest in that part of the world. Um, 
putting everybody on notice. I see Paddy Smith. I'm going to come to first when he gets to the questions. We're getting there. This is like a, a dinner party or something. The uh, It's a really, really interesting conversation. There's lots of things I'd like to put to Marion, Francis and John, but I hold my wish because I see there's a flood of questions and I expect the things I'm thinking about are going to be reflected in the questions. But I want to do one thing first. I was going to give you a bit of notice on this, John, but I, I, I can't give you notice. Could you just give us a sense of the really big policy puzzles that this parliament is going to be looking at. Marion and Francis have mentioned some of them. Nature restoration, the uh, future of the Green Deal, relations with uh, the atrocities in Ukraine and how to support that country in its fight against Russia. What are the kind of big ticket items you think we'll be looking at in the next couple of months? Well, I think the future of the European Green Deal is absolutely front and centre here. And I think the signs are not good. I mean, von der Leyen, I think, did absolutely the right thing in making it the core part of her commission's agenda after 2019. From the beginning of the year, as Marion said, farmers' protests in Brussels and elsewhere put enormous pressure on the EPP in particular. Mm -hmm. And when von der Leyen effectively withdrew a very important pesticides regulation, to me, that was an indication of the Commission giving in to this pressure. So how are we going to see a reconstituted European Green Deal uh, form part of the new policy platform of the Commission? I think that's very important. Second, how to deal with the Trump contagion. Um, mm -hmm. Francis mentioned security and defence. I think we're almost certainly going to see a commissioner for security and defence for the very first time. We're going to have to see, apart from this, um, greater cooperation between the European members of NATO, maybe the fleshing out of the European pillar under NATO. But in terms of the European Union's core activities, um, there is no doubt that trade and the single market are going to be hugely important. You may have seen last week for the first time mm -hmm. Uh, the EU really flexing its muscles using the Digital Markets Act and that altercation that took place between Commissioners Vestager and Thierry Breton on one side and Elon Musk mm. and his ex-platform on the other. Now, we are going to see a lot more of that, I think, um, partly because we're beginning to see the impact of the Digital Markets Act uh, in the real world, it does take a while for these big pieces of legislation to bed down. Um, but how do we react to a Trump administration that is significantly more protectionist? Now, arguably, Biden represented more continuity, at least in terms of trade, than he did discontinuity. And the EU has, I think, been very uncomfortable in trying to respond to the Chips and Science Act and the other vehicles for massive subsidization of green energy by the United States. And in a way, the EU is caught between the Americans and the Chinese, both of which are providing these massive subsidies and the principles of its own single market. So how that tension resolves between the operation of the single market and I think Francis is right. Mario Draghi's report, when it is released, uh, will be very important in laying out uh, the future there. It will also be crucial to have the right people in the right positions in the Commission. Mrs. Vistager will no longer be around. To me, she's been one of the great heroes of the European Union over the last decade in her willingness to take on the biggest companies on earth in defending European consumers and defending the single market, who is going to replace her, um, who's going to be internal market commissioner, trade commissioner. These positions, I think, are going to be absolutely core and vital to the way the commission operates. Similarly, uh, support for Ukraine, can it be maintained? I think everybody now will be aware of the views of Senator Vance, uh, who would withdraw American funding to Ukraine in a heartbeat, there may thus be even more pressure on the European Union to support Ukraine financially and militarily into the future. And a final issue just about deficits. 
some member states are in real trouble. France is running a budget deficit of almost 6% of GDP. In a context where we don't have a government formed, it may be extremely difficult to form a government. If one is formed, it may actually make the budget deficit worse. So what happens if we get some big exogenous event comparable to maybe not the same in scale as 2008? I don't think European economies are uh, well positioned to be able to deal with something like that. The starting point in terms of debt is vastly worse than it was in 2008 coming out of COVID. So how does the EU future proof the Eurozone in particular to deal with those type of challenges? Those are the issues, Barry, that I think will dominate the next parliament. Thanks, John. That's for that upbeat assessment. I don't know if um, I'm keen to, to bring in those who are here who have questions, but Francis, Marion, is there anything you'd like to add to, to what John has said? Points that, you know, Europe has to get serious about capital markets union and banking union to strengthen its own economy. I mean, that's absolutely, it's really disgraceful mm. that they haven't progressed more. And the internal market, I mean, really making sure that the single market, that we get the best juice out of it right across Europe uh, is key because uh, I, John is right. I mean, the economic situation in Europe is not good. The cost of the war, um, the reluctance of member states to want to be contributing more, for example, or maybe not in a position to contribute more. So I, I think sort of strengthening Europe from an economic point of view. I mean, we haven't talked about our citizens, but at the end of the day, dealing with the cost of living issues, the housing crisis, which is not just in Ireland, it's right across Europe or in most member states. I mean, these are the sort of bread and butter issues for people uh, that, you know, we have to find a way of, of managing better than we have right across the union. Marian. I'm happy to go to questions. Fantastic. We have loads of experts in the audience. Loads. I understand. I'm, I'm going to go to you now, Paddy. I'm just, I acknowledge that we've brushed up against a lot of the hot button issues, agriculture, capital markets, Ukraine. Right. I don't think anyone's mentioned migration yet. And I'm just curious the extent to which that's going to feature because it's featured so prominently in, in the elections here. Well, I suppose the migration pact is yeah. agreed, as is nature restoration. I mean, there was a real push to get those done. And Ireland played no small part in that. Oh, um, so um, at least they're not on the agenda at the moment. They, of course, will be. But in the sense of getting the deal done, it's... In the formal sense, it's done. In the formal sense. It's a little bit. Yeah. Excellent. Having the fact.